Hey there, everyone. Welcome to the latest edition of the Market Misbehavior Podcast. I'm your host, Dave Keller. I'm the uh, founder of Market Misbehavior and the president and chief strategist at Sierra Alpha Research. Uh, you know, the Market Misbehavior Podcast, our, our goal is to sit down with top market practitioners, uh, with strategists, traders, analysts, and guests like today, a, uh, a trend follower through and through, a quantitative uh, portfolio manager to understand a little bit more about how they're wired, how they approach the markets, how their process has evolved, what sort of routines and tools and techniques they apply every trading day, their market outlook and how it's in, informed and uh, and impacted by the way that they approach the markets and the lens with, we, with which they uh, view the world. My conversation with Mike Turner, founder of Turner Capital Management, was a lot of fun. And, and honestly, I mean, while I agree with the essence of what Mike does. Mike has a much more systematic approach to trend following than I do, which is probably much more of a subjective use of trend following tools. But I found that a lot of what Mike said really rang home in terms of the fact that markets trend, being able to capture those trends, finding ways where you can make decisions less on emotional inputs and more on the evidence of the markets. Those points I would wholeheartedly agree with. We talked about some of the ways that Mike has designed uh, trend following models for him and his clients to remove the emotional inputs into decision making, to focus more on systematic applications of, uh, of trend based evidence. We talked about multiple time frames and how short-term time frames versus long-term time frames should certainly impact how you are, are designing a model-based approach. We talked about the relationship between fundamental and technical analysis and how the charts reflect uh, expectations about fundamental uh, data. We talked about how you can improve or iterate on a, a successful model over time and how you often have to be nimble and recognize when you're wrong. Recognize when part of your model is just no longer working. I think you'll be interested to hear Mike's example of that here in recent years where he tweaked his model in a pretty big way, focusing less on individual stocks and more on macro uh, themes and indexes. Finally, we talked about leverage and the impact of leverage on returns and how you can be thoughtful and deliberate about how you use leverage based on the market conditions. So please enjoy my recent conversation at the Orlando Money Show with Mike Turner of Turner Capital Management. Welcome, and thank, thank you. you for joining David, me. Appreciate I appreciate it. it. Appreciate it. Uh, so uh, Mike Turner is the uh, founder of Turner Capital Management. For those that aren't familiar with you and your background, I've sure. had the opportunity to learn a lot about what you do. Could you just share just a brief, uh, you know, how you got into this and, and right. sort of what defines your work today? Well, my background is uh, engineering, is math, uh, computer science. I built an enterprise level software company back in the uh, 70s, 80s, and 90s, and, and uh, sold that company, had money for the first time in my life. I uh, put it with a big Wall Street firm. It took them two years to lose half of what I'd worked all my life for. Uh, I still had a, a reasonable amount of money left over even after they lost half of it. <clears throat> and I decided, you know, I probably can't lose money any worse than what they did. And so I began doing what all entrepreneurs in math people do is I began looking at the market and how I could go about solving the problem of growing that money, what I had left. I started out with a book that I had read actually years before called uh, Consistent Profits in the Stock Market by Curtis Dahl. No one probably knows about him, but it was a great book. And I had, over the years, I had highlighted every paragraph, every, uh, you, I went through that book. I'd written the code for it if I was going to write a program for it. I did all of that. So when all this happened, I thought, I think I'll start there. And it was a technical uh, analysis book. It was all that he didn't care about fundamentals. And it was all about individual stocks and, and looking at um, uh, when to get in, when to get out. I'm going to fast forward now to 2022. So I built that system. I was doing well with it. My clients were doing By the way, I'm, a, I'm a, an, an RIA, Registered Investment Advisor. Uh, I'm a fiduciary. That means I can't lie. Well, I can, <laughs> but it's against the law for me to you lie. You shouldn't. I shouldn't sure, lie. Yeah. And, and um, I... Um, uh, I make a lot of money for my clients. We're up uh, another million bucks today, and over the last uh, uh, four weeks, we're up about uh, nearly six million. I'm not a big firm. We've got about um, uh, 130 million under management, uh, but we're growing, and we're growing very rapidly because people are finding out about what we do. And what we do is really very difficult in many ways to say without sounding insulting, and I don't want to do that. But I want you to know that I used to believe what everybody else is currently doing, which is this. 
you want to do a lot of research about what you think is going to happen. You look at the economics of what's going to happen. You look at interest rates. You look at uh, uh, inflation. You look at who's going to be winning or losing the, the, the presidential election. Everything you want to think about. Look at sectors. Look at seasonality. Look at everything that's out there and try to decide what. Whether I should buy or sell this particular stock based on all of my research, the fundamentals of the stock, the company, all of that, the technicals, all of that, why? Because I believe or don't believe that it will grow into the future and I will make money based on that decision. You're basing your decision. I used to do it. Almost everybody probably in here does it. Is you look at the world around you and you try to say what's likely going to happen and invest accordingly. Now, I'm going to tell you that's all wrong. Okay? As familiar as that is, about what everybody does, I have learned that that's wrong. I used to do it. I was wrong. Here's what I have learned. Nobody can forecast the, the market successfully. Everybody can forecast it. Nobody can do so successfully, consistently. We can all guess about what it's going to do. Even when you're looking at the heat maps and, and the like of, of, of what you were looking at, that kind of gives you a feeling, and that's where you get in trouble, that, well, everything is green, therefore it's probably going to stay green. Okay? There's that sense. That you, it's human nature. Okay? You, you, you can't get away from that. But that's not how you make money in the market. Here's the way I make money in the market for my clients, and I make them a lot of money. What's a lot of money? My 1X version is averaging over uh, the last – from when I've tested beginning of 2006 when ETFs came out, index ETFs, it's, it averages about 14, 15% a year. That's about double what the, the, the average of the S&P is. The 2X, okay, is about double that. So it's doing about 25, 26% a year. And the, the 3X is triple that. So it's going to be around 35%, okay. Now, do I say to my clients, I'm a fiduciary member, if, if you said, oh, Mike, I'll take some of that, thank you. Okay, I'm not promising you that I can get those kinds of returns. I'm just saying that when I tested this methodology I'm going to talk about here in a little bit, that's where it comes from. So long story short, David, is that I believe the following. In fact, I know the following. You need to know where the market is. That's exactly what you do, and I, I like that. You need to know how the market got there. That's a trend. Mm. I use the five-week. I Just about everything I do is on a weekly basis. I use the five-week, the 10-week, the 20-week, the 30-week, the 40-week, the 45-week, the 200-week, the 188-week. Okay, I do all of those. I, I use a, a histogram so I can kind of look at how momentum is moving with regard to the market. Is, is, is my histogram stepping up or stepping down? It's a big deal. So here's what I know, and here's how I make money for my clients. I know where the market is. Everybody knows that. I know how the market got there. That's the trend that it was on to get there. And the following is true. You just have to believe it. It is true. The trend that the market is in will last exactly until it doesn't. <laughs> now... The key is not when you buy, it's how you sell and when you sell. And you do that by knowing when the trend has changed. You know, a lot of people, particularly the, um, uh, the fundamentalists out there, they'll say, oh, you got to study the fundamentals, the economics of it, on and on. And they'll say, and nobody has ever been able to be successful at timing the market. I don't time the market. Timing the market means trying to pick tops and bottoms. I don't do that. The trend, which everything's about the trend, period, in my world. Market goes up, hits the top, I'm not out yet. Starts going down, it goes down enough, I'm out. I go from being bullish to in cash in money markets, and then I wait to see what the next trend is going to be. The next trend might be back up. It might the next trend might be going down lower. When it hits certain key points, trends, other trends that it crosses, then I'll know whether to go back in long, bullish, or go back in 
short. Now, I don't short the market. That's too risky for my world. I will buy long position and inverse index ETFs when we go into a bear market. So what does that mean? That means I don't fear, my clients don't fear a bear market because they know we won't get in at the very beginning. By definition, when do all bear markets start? At a market top. Mm. They all start there, right? Yeah. Every one of them. Yeah. Now, you don't know that at the time, but if you follow the trends and you live by those trends, and, and I'm, you and I are on exactly the same page, David, is that the trends are how you make money in this market. So yeah. when it becomes evident that it's a bear market, I go into inverse index ETFs. That's kind of where it is. That's where I do, what I do. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, I'm curious from uh, people here in the audience uh, at The Money Show, uh, how many of you have experienced a pretty successful 2024 in your portfolio? However you would define that. Pretty good year. Okay. Pretty much every hand is yep. up. How many of you are concerned about what happens between now and year end, given the instability and other things going on? Were you, I thought you were raising your hand for a second there. No. Okay, good. <laughs> no. Okay. I was just so studying on. the yeah, answers. Yeah, right. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Right. <laughs> and, and I think, that's the, I think that gets to your point, right? You, um, yeah. Uh, is that is the uncertainty um, a lot of times causes us to make really bad decisions. And a lot of my work and, and my brand is called Market Misbehavior to acknowledge that many of us do really boneheaded things with our capital and with our lives in general when emotions get the best of oh, us. Oh, yeah. So, emotions is... is the thing that, and, and everybody has them. We're all human beings. We've yep. all got emotions. And the way I solve that problem is, is I take an engineer's point of view. You're going to build a bridge across a chasm. It's a, it's a mile long. It's a deep, it's a 2,000 foot deep ca chasm. So the engineer comes out, structural engineer, to design that bridge. They get ready to have opening day, going to have the ribbon cutting. And the mayor of the local town comes out and sucks the, talks to the engineer and says, what do you think about it? And he says, well, I'm pretty sure all these 18 wheelers that are lined up to cross it can get across it without it falling. You think the engineer says that? No. <laughs> okay. He did not emotionally build that bridge. It's all based on rules. You have to have rules. And I like to say you make the rules, but the rules make the trades. Mm, I like that. And it, it, it's a different, and again, what I, what I appreciate about what you're saying, it's a different mentality. You know. Instead of focusing your intellectual energy as an investor to manage your emotions and make decisions about what stocks to pick, it's more getting the rules right and, and yeah. making, oh, you know, yeah. having a good discipline to it. I'm curious because earlier today, uh, we sat down with uh, Mark Scousey uh, yeah. and talked about a lot of different things. You sat down with him as well for maybe a, perhaps a more contentious discussion yes, called was. the economics professor versus the mathematician. Right. I'm curious how that went and who won the debate. Well, they did a poll uh, oh, yeah. uh, okay. at the end okay. and it, it was kind of 50, 50 <laughs> and, and, uh, uh, for Mark, that's a win because <laughs> we've debated, I think, now three times over the last several years, and, yeah. and, and I've always won those, I think, handily. At least he says I have. <laughs> He's a gracious gentleman. But they, they did a show of hands. It was about half for me, about half for, the, for, for Mark. Um, and I was a bit surprised at that, just to be honest with you. But yeah. here's the thing, David, that I, I find. That when you say to people, when I say to people, all your life you have worked hard at trying to figure out how to invest wisely now for what you're expecting to have happen later. Mm. And so you spend all your life thinking about, I want to make a really good decision now because of what I think is going to happen. Yeah. And there's a lot of stress. There's a lot of emotion involved in that. And I'm saying, at least from the market standpoint, the market goes where the market wants to go, mm. period. And, and the market doesn't care what you think. It doesn't right? care what you think. And so you might as well sit back and wait for it to do it and mm. then act. There's plenty of time. You don't have to say, oh, I needed to know that the bottom was last week. No, you don't. Mm. The bottom can hit or the top can hit, and then you've got plenty of time. Very seldom, very seldom. Do you go from a market top to a market bottom in a week? Rarely does that happen. And so you need to be looking at when you see those signals, trends, mm -hmm. that violate 
Okay, my trend was going up, and now it's going down. What do I do? Go to cash. Well, why not go short? Because it hasn't gone far enough yet to tell me it needs mm. to be short. Can you talk a little bit more about the time frame? Because I know a lot of people, at least you know, in my familiarity with a lot of quantitative methodology, it, it, it by definition is super short term, right? We're looking at quick swings, you know, some of the most successful hedge funds have been with that sort of time frame. Right. You're deliberately waiting for weekly I'm deliberately data waiting. points. Can yeah. you talk about what that does to yeah. your, first of how all, that impacts your process? First of all, when you go out to stock charts, for example, yeah. or, or any place, and you look at uh, various uh, uh, markets or, or indexes or individual stocks, mm -hmm. okay? You can look at the dailies. You can look at the, at the, the uh how much it's fluctuating on volatility on a day-by-day -day basis, candlesticks, whatever you want to look at. In our world, my world, we take one week as one data point. Nothing else exists but that one data point. Okay? So I don't care what happens. I mean, we happen to pick Friday. It could be Thursday. It could be Tuesday. It doesn't matter what day it is. And that day represents the market for that week period. And that's for getting in. So all the rules I put together, and I've got 12 rules, and, and uh, the rules I put together, and by the way, eight of those 12 rules are about getting out. <laughs> right. That tells you something, right? Yeah. Okay. Four of them are, are getting in. Hmm. And so we, we get in on the weekly analysis. We get out when the daily trend violates our rule to get out. So we'll get mm. out any time during the week. Right. But you set the rule. You yeah, updated it on exactly. Friday. Right. Yeah. And, and why? Well, I've done a lot of testing, hundreds of thousands of tests. And you need to be able to – the way you make money in the market is getting out at the right time. Mm. The, getting in is easy. You get it. I mean, it's a bull market right now. We were 100% cash this time last week. I'm 100% in the market as of last Friday. Now, why? Did, did some big thing happen? No, no big thing happened. But the trend that the market was on, we'd been in cash about three weeks. The market had begun, if you recall, begun to roll over. Yep. And it was beginning to move toward a, uh, actually it was getting pretty close to where if it had moved about another four and a half, six percent, it would have triggered it uh, going into the inverse world, but it didn't get anywhere near that, and it began to rebuild, came right back up, wiped out all of that rolling over, and now it's trending higher. That all happened as of our one data point last Friday. Mm. So we went all in, 50% in the S&P 500, 50% in the NASDAQ. And by the way, a lot of people don't understand this. Even though we do the 1X, the 2X, and the 3X, they're not all in there together, but we trade them all at the same time. We don't analyze the individual ETFs. We analyze the market, and I have, an, I have a, a chart that I built, and it's, it's an index that, that I built. It's, it's comp comprised of four indexes, the S&P 500, the NASDAQ, the Russell 2000, the Dow, and they are not equally weighted, but that tells me, in my world, what the market is, and that's all I care about. I don't care about individual stocks. I don't care which ones are going up, which ones are going down. I let the, in fact, what I like to do, David, is this. When I look at that chart on the overall market, I look at it as this. It is the um, collective wisdom of every trader in the world. <laughs> you take all of the uh, hedge funds. You take all of the analysts, BlackRock, everybody else. You name the, the, the outfit. Every individual in this room. At the end of whatever analysis they do, they have to end up buying or selling shares. Mm -hmm. And that shows up on that chart for where the market is. Yeah. So that market is the collective wisdom. You could call it stupid wisdom if you want to, or smart, but it tells you where the entire market is. And if, all, if the entire market is at this point, and it moved from down here to up there to get to that point, what kind of a trend is it on? It's on a bullish trend. What do you do in a bullish trend? You want to own the market. Now, you could say, well, I, I like trading stocks. I did too. Two years ago and, and, and before, I, trading ETFs or the in, indexes, that was boring as dirt, you know. And so I didn't want to do that. So I tried taking this methodology that you and I are talking about and mm -hmm. applying it to individual stocks. 
But maybe you've noticed this. Sometimes the market's moving up in a nice trend, and you've got some stocks going down. That chart you put up there. For sure, yep. It wasn't all green. No. Okay. Mm -hmm. Even though we've been in a nice bullish move for quite some time in yeah. the market, mm -hmm. not every stock's participating. Yeah. So if I'm going to be measuring where the market is and how it got there, I need to trade the market. You know, if you talk about price representing all the collective activity of all the traders, I have to call you an honorary technical analyst. You're, <laughs> I know you don't consider yourself one, but that's that's the argument right there that you it just is. made. Yeah, so I see that. Congratulations yeah, on your, on your you. honorary take title that as a I just bestowed upon you. Um, you know, uh, it's interesting, On I think on your Amazon profile, the quote I picked off was, the objective of Mike's methodology is to think like a fundamentalist, but trade like a technician. Yeah. Which I thought that was a really interesting quote. Can you talk about, you know, there's not a lot of fundamental inputs in there, but how does your investment process benefit or, or I guess, acknowledge the fundamental uh, data, as it were? Well, that's, that's Amazon's a little bit out of date. The, <laughs> the um, uh, that used to be a statement I used. Yeah. And I used that until, like I said, 2022. Mm. And in 2022, fundamentals didn't keep a stock up. Mm. So it really pivoted to more of a, I, a, a I pivoted trend, more to, to, to technical. Yeah, right. Okay, here's the thing. Diversification doesn't keep you from experiencing a bear market. Fundamentals don't keep that stock from going all the way down to half where it is. You know, I debated Mark today, Skousen, and he has a chart he throws up there about uh, dividends and how great it is to own dividends. Well, you can lose way more than the gain you had in the dividends in a bear market. Dividends don't save you. If we get a dividend in trading an, an index ETF, thank you, that's a bonus, move on. Okay? Yeah. yeah. So it's, it's really what I have come down to is that uh, and I and, and it is and I, like I said, I'm trying to be very honest and clear with you. Two and a half, three years ago, I wouldn't have said what I'm saying right now. Technicals are all that matters. Oof. That's okay. all that matters. That's the tagline for the, for yeah. the discussion today. Right. Okay, um, fair fair enough. I mean, I'm curious because you've been doing this for how long? Have you been running models of some sort? Uh, uh, Twenty three years. So you know, a couple of years ago, kind of a transform or transformational moment where either the conditions changed or you recognize that things were a little bit different. You know what I mean? Yeah. And I'm curious with your model with 12 rules, what's the process of evaluating and reevaluating and at some point recognizing that rule was really awesome until 2025, but starting now I needed, you know, I mean, what's the iterative, is there a process? There is an iterative and process. How do, you, how do you approach that? Absolutely. And, and uh, the, the, the way you start it is when you're wrong. <laughs> okay. So if, if I have a rule and it's not working, it's pretty obvious when it's not working. Mm. The, the thing that happened for me was this. When 22 came along, and it was in October of 22, that we had had a... Not a horrible year. We still had beat the market uh, that year, but uh, the, 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 the huge changes in, in the whipsaws, and they were big. They were, they were 18 to 20-some-odd percent, and they were, they were big. We just were not reacting well to them. When I say we, my methodology. And so I sat down to figure out why, not wanting to change what I was doing, just fix what I was doing. Hmm. And so I began looking at, well, why did I not detect the market going down? And when I should have gotten out of my, and I generally traded 20 to, to 40 stocks. That's generally what I had in my mm. client portfolios and mine. Because I'm all in with my clients. I, I don't play one game and do another. I'm all in. And um, uh, so I began trying to find out why that was. And I, I, I finally started, I had a set of rules before. In fact, I wrote a book called, Ten rules. Okay? Yeah, that's all right. right. Yeah, all right. And and uh, I finally started saying, "All right, I got to throw all this out." I mean, I can't I can't figure out how to get the dadgum trend. How do I how do I find out when the market is going to hurt me? How do I know that? And it was all mm -hmm. what's going to happen, what's going to happen, and that's where I started out because that's where we all are. That's where we all get into trying to figure out what's going to happen and anticipate it. And in that process, as I began throwing out. Uh, my the, the rules I had used in the past, I finally got to the point of saying, 
wait a minute, I just got to, I got to tear everything up, which most people have a hard time doing. I want to tear everything up, and I do too, we all do, and look at it from a perspective of just the market. And quit thinking about stocks, because what, that's what I keep asking myself. How did I miss the move on the market? It was always the market, the market kept coming up. So I said, all right, I'm just going to do an analysis on how to know what's going on in the market. And I, I've, got, I've done all kinds of things. I've done cycle analysis. I've done uh, where you, you're doing all kinds of sinusoidal waves and forecasting and everything you can imagine. I've, I've done it all. And I began to realize that I could know what the market is doing. And it was enough to not have to know what it's going to do. And I got through with that. And it was like 2 o'clock in the morning. It's like uh, the second week of December of, of 22. And, and I do all this. I mean, I'm, I'm consumed by it. And, and I've been working for days and hours at a time, round the clock. It was about 2 o'clock in the morning, and, and I was looking at this, and I said, what? why is this not working for stocks? Because back to the same thing I said earlier, yeah. not every stock would work. I'd plug in a stock, and it wouldn't always work. Yeah. But when I'd plug in the market, it would. And I'm sitting there, and I'm thinking, well, idiot. Why don't you sit, try trading the market? And that was just an epiphany to me. I had never thought about doing that, of trading the market. And so I ran my algorithms again on trading the market, and boom, 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 boom. They all hit. And I thought, I need, so the, the second uh, axiom, I guess, one mm -hmm. is it's not fundamentals and technicals. Yeah. It's just technicals. And the other is you don't need to be trading stocks. Mm. I'm anti-stocks because the market is you can make a boatload of money in just the market you don't need to find it in NVIDIA you don't need to find those stocks they're already in the market and so in my world I have simplified my life from, from a huge universe of stock picking Okay, and how do you go about, and, and stock picking, you need to look at fundamentals, you need to look at technicals. There's a whole process for stock picking. There are no fundamentals in an index. It just is what the collective is, results of, of the entire, all the stocks that are in that index. Mm -hmm. And so I don't look at fundamentals from this. I don't go in and try to assess the collective amount of fundamentals on good stocks and bad stocks that come up with. I don't do that. I have just learned that the technicals, the trend is, the old saying, the trend is your friend, is so true. But you have to step outside the, the uh, mindset that you've been in that it's important for you to know what's going to happen. When people, my own clients, okay, they, I mean, you get asked on CNBC, what's the market going to be at the end of the year? What's going to happen if Trump wins? What's going to happen if Harris wins? On and on. And, and, I, and my own clients will say, no, now, Mike, I know you don't really care about what's going to happen. What's going to happen? What do you think is going to happen? <laughs> so I, I get asked those questions. But I have a personal opinion okay, about what I think is going to happen if various events occur. You know, Israel just pulled a big coup today of some kind. They've, mm. they, they knocked out a, a big guy over in, in Iran, I think. And as you don't know. We've got, you've got all kinds of things in the world that can happen, and, and you can't find two candidates for president that are more diametrically opposite to each other than the two that we have running. That's got to have an impact on a lot of things. Yeah. I don't care. <laughs> I care personally. I don't care from the standpoint of making yeah. money in the market. It, it, um, you mentioned that there's leverage involved, right? There's sort of like the 1x, 2x, 3x. Yeah. Is that a decision that someone would make on what exposure, or is there a part of your model that decides whether to take on leverage or not? We have three strategies. You have okay. to pick one of the three. Got it. Well, I take that back. I've got clients that are in all three, but they've got three accounts. Right, right, right. One for each one. Yeah. Now, I did have a gentleman come by today, the booth, and, and, and he threw an idea out at me that, that I've got to go now test. And he said, when, he said, you do measure risk. I do. I have another whole algorithm that's measuring risk, okay? <laughs> Potential for uh, likelihood, and again, it gets really close to forecasting, which I don't want to do, but what is the risk in the market right now? 
Now, if what it's going to be, what is it right now? And there are a lot of ways to go about measuring that risk. It's really trend-based. What's the slope on the trends? Are this, is the slope increasing or decreasing? Yep. Are we getting closer to a, 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 a 200 day moving average or how far above the 200 day are we? And on and on, 200 week. Anyway, he said, have you thought about moving from 3X to 2X when risk gets higher or from 2X to 1X when risk gets higher? Yeah. And I, well, I don't have clients in that situation. They're either in one or the other. But I kind of like that idea. I'm trying to kind of figure out how I could work that into a portfolio. Mm. That it's a yeah, more of a dynamic. Risk yeah, it's, kind of, it's yeah, a it's dynamically a run yeah. uh, portfolio. Mm -hmm. That the higher the risk, we dial down to one x. The lower the risk, we dial up to, to three. Yeah, I gotta I gotta test some of that. Do you think I was going to ask you what's next for Turner Capital and the evolution of this model that you've been doing? Is it is it that? Is it more a, a, a thoughtful use of leverage or deliberate yeah, use of well, leverage? Or what, what do you think is next? First of all, there are two worlds that I live in. One world is the SMA world. Okay, that's that's individually managed accounts. Okay, and the other world is the RIA world. Now, registered investment advisories. Let me tell you the thing that most advisors, professional advisors, hate above all things, and that is trading. They don't know how, and they don't want to. They want to put you into a, generally a bunch of stocks, mutual funds primarily, and buy and hold and stay there. Okay. But their clients are saying, why would you have me in here if the market's tanking? Okay. Mm -hmm. And so they, they don't like to be in that situation. They'll come back and say, the market always comes back. Right. Only the weak hands go in and out of the market. All those sayings so that you don't bug them about the fact that you're losing money. So I've had several ad advisory firms come to me and say, would you take over that part of our business? Mm. Would you do the sub-advisory work? Right. So we're beginning to open up that world for the yeah. sub -advisor. So we'll be a sub-advisor to a lot of other uh, RIAs. We don't actually manage the client's at all the, yeah. the, the the advisor does yep. but we have the permission to manage the amount of money they put into one of our strategies That's so excellent. we're doing that the other is is just like the, the gentleman that came by we get ideas all the time about how to put together a model or a strategy that the clients want to want to have because that's our business we want more clients yep and you know we've got about 550 clients we've got about 700 uh, client accounts and We've got about 130 million under management, and my goal is by this time next year to be at 300 million. So if I'm going to be at 300 million under management, a lot of things got to happen. We've got to get a lot more individual <laughs> clients, and we've got to get a lot of, uh, of, of RIAs, but that's the plan. Mike, this was awesome. I appreciate you so much. You, you and I, and I, and I don't, to be totally honest, I don't agree with everything that you said. I agree with a lot of it, though, and, it, and the essence of trend following, we are 100% on the same page, and I, I really hope that our conversation has helped all of us think a little bit more yeah. about the benefits of following trends and, uh, and the opportunities. And I wish you the well with Turner Capital. Well, thank sure. you very much. Thanks, I appreciate Mike. it. Thanks, Everyone, Mike. join me in thanking Mike Turner of Turner Capital. Thank you. Thank you. So that was my conversation at the Orlando Money Show with Mike Turner of Turner Capital Management. And again, I agree in so many ways with what Mike was talking about, just the benefits of trend following, the challenges investors face with the behavioral inputs in their process and, and looking for ways to minimize their impact. Uh, I think Mike and I have different ways of sort of solving and addressing that issue. Mike, for Mike, it was more of a systematic, mathematical, quantitative approach, which means I can take all of the behavioral issues out of it by just focusing on the numbers, thinking of the markets as a mathematical problem to be analyzed and solved, and, uh, and focus my attention on a model that more and more and better and better and over time uh, is able to uh, better track the, uh, the trends in the markets and help me be on the right side of things. My approach is more behavioral, right? More recognizing that there are four pillars to what we do, the fundamental, the technical, the macroeconomic, and the behavioral. And remembering that technical analysis, what I was just, what I would uh, include Mike's, uh, you know, sort of quantitative trend following approach is essentially pure technical analysis, just models based on that. Uh, I think that's part of it, but I think there are other tools we can also use to enhance uh, that, uh, that pure uh, analysis of price 
and trend. I particularly appreciate it uh, if you have considered, you know, uh, using some sort of quantitative model, alpha models in your uh, process. I appreciated Mike's thoughts about using leverage and just the different ways to think of it, uh, multiple time frames, short term versus long term, and how that should inform your, uh, you know, decisions about how to construct your model. Um, you know, thinking about how you improve the model and thinking of a quantitative or a mathematical approach as an iterative process. I found so many times, whether you are more quantitative or more, you know, fundamental and, uh, and, and behaviorally based in your own uh, investment process, I found too often people find something that works in the markets and then they just keep doing it and it keeps working. But then eventually it stops working, but they keep doing it because they think they found the answer. And what you have to remember, and I think Mike's comments about a, a uh, you know transformative event here in recent years where he was focusing very much on individual stocks, but then really pivoted and focused more on a different type of model for a different sort of, uh, sort of era and recognizing that the market structures were changing, recognizing that the model that had helped him up until that point was starting to not work as well and then having the courage and the conviction to you know try to improve things and just not stick with something that's familiar just because uh, it's familiar and uh, and focusing on how the evidence of the markets has changed. I hope you enjoyed my conversation with Mike Turner of Turner Capital Management. Thanks so much for tuning in to the Market Misbehavior Podcast. I would love to know who else you'd like me to interview as part of this series. We're having a lot of fun uh, talking to uh, market practitioners, money managers, strategists, technical analysts, and, uh, and, uh, and many, many more. But would appreciate any ideas you have. Just drop it in a comment below the video you're watching on our YouTube channel. All of our previous uh, podcast episodes and future episodes can certainly be found on our YouTube channel called Market Misbehavior and hopefully very soon on your favorite podcast platform. By the way, if you're looking to improve your own investment process, if you want to think about some of the ways that Mike was uh, addressing behavioral challenges and you need help sort of removing some of the behavioral influences on your own investment process, our free behavioral investing course may be a really good place to start. You can go to marketmisbehavior.com slash free course or just scan the QR code you see on your screen. Check it out. It's a free uh, email course. We won't share your email. We'll just share great ideas and insights and ways to nudge your thinking, how you think about how you think about the markets. That's it for today for Market Misbehavior. I'm Dave Keller. And remember, it's always a good time to own good charts.